Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. Coming at you uh, less than one week out from turkey season, isn't that yeah. right? Yeah, at least in Alabama. Turkey season starts on Monday. Mississippi's already up and running. Yeah. Four to two. Yeah, a bunch of lucky sons of guns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, I've still only been out to listen one time, uh, and I just heard that, that one turkey, but I don't know. we got a year of history with the place, so I'm still feeling good about it. Um, I kind of wish it wasn't opening on a Monday, but, you know, it is what it is. You know. It, it definitely well. I mean, that's only for private land too. That's what's kind of kind of rough about it. But yeah, yeah no, I, I'm I'm very interested in seeing how like this season progresses because I was actually talking to a future guest of ours. Uh, okay. who I think we may try to record with next week, and he was saying he's like, dude, this might be our hardest season yet, just because they're they're further along in the pattern compared to like where they've typically been the last few years because of how early the spring has been. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's hunting some private land. He's like. Turkeys are typically, he's like, you know, I typically see them in specific areas this time of the year. I've got trail cameras out just kind of monitoring them, and he's like, they're completely shifted, kind of like what they would be doing, you know, typically like that second, almost like a second, almost third week of April. Yeah. Um, he's like, they're already moving to some of those spots. So it's like, they're like dispersing a little bit more instead of like being in like his bigger groups of birds. Hmm. So he's like, it'd be interesting to see, you know, you know, how that first week of season on probably and goes for a lot of people. Uh, because I think he's like down here, he's like, you know, it, it should be good, but he's like, they're definitely like starting to disperse a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, there used to be a place that we hunted near a river and this is actually the same place that we talked about a couple weeks ago where you like missed that bird mm-hmm. and we did the fly downs with our hats and yeah. they came right in. Uh, so in that area, you're hunting relatively close to a river. And it, back when we opened on March 15th, it would always be right there at the beginning. The first two weeks of season, they were like really sucked in tight to that river, mm-hmm. which was kind of hard because the property boundaries over there made it difficult to actually get on them because some of the the property boundaries went through there weird. So some of the river banks were private. Some mm-hmm. of it was public. So it was like really hard to actually get on those turkeys. And it would actually get better once you started getting into May, or not May, uh, April, April, because uh, I, I think it was because other stuff was greening up. Mm-hmm. And so they would, they they weren't forced down on that, on that river. Cause in the river, some stuff would start greening up earlier than yeah. surrounding areas. And, uh, and then they'd come up into the pines where we can hunt them and, and miss them and spook them and do all the, do all the stuff. You know, it is what it is. But yeah, that, that's why I'm, I'm kind of interested now of where I found some birds last year early on and kind of, you know, cause I've, I haven't been out to be able to spot check some of those areas quite yet. I'm going to hopefully be able to do it a little bit this weekend. And then, uh, also, you know, in between, you know, film with you and hunting with you on the club, spot checking a couple pieces of public yeah, and, and just trying to get a better idea of how everything's kind of laying out. But, uh, they, then other than, I don't know if, I don't know about it went out like this last couple of days when we've had some real cold weather. Uh, I say real cold. It went from being like 75, 80 degrees, to like, I think yesterday's high was like maybe 60, 59, yeah. 58, something like that. Yeah, it was cold. And uh, got, got a late frost. Got, yeah, got down below freezing, which I'm interested in seeing how that affects some uh, some red oaks come this fall. Um, well, it probably definitely killed our pears. We've got a couple pear trees. Yeah. And I, I'm pretty sure our pears are toast. Well, that, This happened last year. It killed all of them. Well, it's like maybe not even with the red oaks, but like white oaks and everything. I, I'm curious and also persimmons how, how that affected. Because, I mean, it was chilly, real chilly, real stagnant air. It wasn't really blowing hard at night. And uh, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how that kind of progresses for feed trees later on. Because, I mean, trees were budding. By the way, so I just got back from Biloxi. Okay. Yep. We went down there. And, dude, when you got south of, like, Montgomery in, in South Alabama going into like um, real south uh, Mississippi. Dude, it was like April 30th down there. It was so green. <laughs> Dude, it was so freaking green. Like up here, it's like, it, it's, you know, you're getting some buds popping, some pollen and all that kind of stuff. But like the understory is not growing up yet, dude. Down there, it was a freaking jungle. Yeah, <laughs> I'm telling you, it was a jungle, dude. I was yeah. like, this is insane. I noticed the same thing, but in reverse. When I'll go to like Tennessee mm-hmm. in mid November, yeah, and you hit that Tennessee state line and you start getting up in that area, and it's like winter, and it's oh, still yeah. green at home. Yeah, like because I was talking to somebody about that the other day about how. Uh, like our seasons are so different based on how north you are because we're not totally, you know, leaf off wintertime cover until like early December probably. Mm-hmm. All through November, you s- we still have leaves that are holding like really, really good. Yeah. Uh, and then same thing in, in the reverse in the springtime. Um, like right now we're starting to put out, but if you go up there, it's still like winter. winter. Yeah. yeah it's still crazy. Winter. Yeah, and the uh, I was talking. Oh, so there was one thing. I'm curious for any of you guys listening on the podcast or watching on the podcast. 
that live down South Alabama, uh, South Mississippi. Man, I saw this shrub, and I have no idea what it is. It looked like leaf structure similar to privet, but like a darker color, like a darker color, like green. Mm. Um, but it was the thickest, nastiest stuff. Like, I would not want – I don't think it's got thorns on but it would be miserable walking yeah. through. And it was like – we were down there – and uh, we went golfing one day, and we had to drive through a little state park to go go golf. And on the way in, it was just like all that stuff underneath all these pines, and it was like six, seven foot tall. Just I'm talking about nasty cover. Mm. And I was, I was just, I should have went out with, uh, was it Plan ID or whatever one of those apps yeah, are? Yeah, yeah. And took a photo. iNaturalist. I naturally should have took a photo of it to figure out what it was, but it was freaking everywhere. And I'm curious if it's native or not. Uh, but that it, it was so thick and nasty, but. Um, uh, while we were down there, uh, saw some, some old boys from Florida, not Florida, uh, Texas that were hunting, uh, on some of that ground down there. And I was like, okay, well, there's, there's some boys down there. Uh, but getting it, after it. it, it was, yeah, it, it was interesting seeing how green everything was. Cause I mean, you went down there and I felt like I was in late April up here where it's just, I mean, everything's leafed out. All the oaks were leafed out, everything. And yep. then, you know, I just drive a couple hours North and it's like, done yeah it's, it was kind of it's kind of sad coming back i'll be honest <laughs> <laughs> like coming back i'm like oh man this is like this is pitiful where we're at yeah um that's actually a really good point you bring up too but about something people can be paying attention to right now for this coming fall is where the frost is happening like a late frost especially when you start having your trees butt out whether it's persimmons or if you're up north and you got apple trees uh oaks whatever the case may yeah. be that late frost can actually kill some of that stuff and i'd and I saw uh, a pretty interesting post, I think it was last year or the year before, in Arkansas, where in the, the mountains of Arkansas, where someone had, it might have been a drone shot or something, but it was the mountains, and you could see the frost line on the mountain. Mm. And the frost line was like everything in the valley and the tops weren't frosted. And I think it had something to do with like low cloud cover, and uh, essentially like like if you've ever been around like a let's say like a lake like you're going let's say you're going fishing in mm. the winter time and you and you go to a lake and you're leaving the house early in the morning and there's like a frost you know the yard's all frosty and then but you get towards the lake and then all of a sudden you get there and it's like foggy and you get out and it's like 8 degrees warmer even though it's the same ambient temperature but that fog like insulates mm -hmm. the land and so you it, it might be just outside of the fog line it might be like 32 degrees in a hard frost but inside the fog it's like 38 degrees or something like we've we've both seen that before uh and i think someone explained that that can happen up in the mountains as well like you have that low bank of fog or you have you have a higher bank of fog like higher up the mountain and so the lower area gets the frost mm -hmm. but however it happens all that to say that if you live in more mountainous or just bigger hill country that that's how you'll hear mountain guys talk about oh yeah the there, there's only mast up above like whatever foot this year. Like I've hear I've heard Georgia guys talk about that. Like oh I'm I'm finding white oaks dropping, but only above like 2,200 feet or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, so that's something that you can maybe pay attention to in, in your area and see where the frost line is at, or see what see where stuff is budding out and what does get frosted and what doesn't, because uh, that could potentially impact your your fall this year. And then you know you can go check those areas first thing. Uh, going into this fall, like when you're going to check mass trees, you know which areas to check first to see if they uh, they produce or not. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, you need to find that photo because I, I don't remember mm -hmm. seeing something like that, but that, that's pretty neat, though. Uh, it was backwards than what you thought it would because you would think that like, the frost would be up on the peaks, mm -hmm. but the frost was like halfway down all the way to the bottom. The top, there was no frost on it whatsoever. Uh, I can't remember. Someone had some some explanations for it, but I can't remember what they were now. I might have got that totally wrong, but I remember seeing the photo, and I was like, oh, wow, that was interesting. And people were saying, hey, watch out this fall. We're probably going to have mast up at, at up top, and the valleys aren't going to have much in them. Uh, because at the time that frost happened, a lot of those oaks and other mast-bearing trees were already um, like leafing out, and they had the buds and everything. And I, I think what happens, again, I could be wrong about this, but what happens is like those little buds are, are tight, all year and they're they're not open and they're wrapped up and they're safe so they can withstand you know all winter but in the spring they start opening up and that flower you know produces and that flower is what is susceptible to the frost so mm -hmm. the frost can like somehow destroy it and like it happened with our pear trees last year we have two pear, big pear trees at mama mike's house really there's pear trees there oh yeah 
Like, oh. one year, we got a heap of pears. Like, uh, more pears than we knew what to do with. So we tried to make wine with them. We made a bunch of vinegar. It wasn't good. And uh, But last year, we were all excited because we were like, we're going to get this recipe dialed. And then last year, we got a late frost. When those things were, I mean, fully bloomed out. I mean, the whole thing is like white. Destroyed it. Th- didn't, didn't get a single pear off of them last year. And then this frost just happened. And we went over, they got some, we got blueberry bushes here and we got blueberry bushes over there. And uh, Mike was out of town. He's actually fishing for shoal bass. Mm-hmm. And um, he was out of town, so I was I went over there to go cover up his blueberries. And those those pear trees are just... And they're too big to, like, cover. I don't have anything to cover them with, but I got there, and so, I was like, oh, man. So I, I've, I've heard, I think, on some of the, like, peach plantations and stuff like that, peach farms, I think they, I've heard them running some kind of fan system uh-huh. to, like, keep frost from, like, building up. I don't understand how that works. Anyways, like, keeping the moisture off. I don't know. I, I've heard something about running, like, fans, like, big, like, they had massive fans Yeah. Uh, to keep, um, like, ice from forming or something like that, keeping from moisture from building up on the plants itself. Yeah, um, that's interesting. But, uh, yeah, if someone has experience with that, write in. I'd be curious. Yeah, I'd be curious. Like, Somebody write in, and maybe we'll correct. If like, you work if on, we, if you work on an orchard, I want to know how y'all deal with that crap. <laughs> yeah, that's actually very interesting. I'd be curious to know. I'd be very curious to know, uh, but yeah. Other than that, man, I'm excited about turkey season starting. Um, I'm excited about. Uh, I'm excited about checking some more deer cameras. I'm not gonna lie. Um, I got some cameras that I can't wait to check. Still haven't checked them. You know which ones I'm talking about mm-hmm. too. And uh, I'm gonna try to go get them this weekend, but I don't know if I'm gonna be able to. Um, but also on that on that note, uh, before we kind of get into some Q and A's and such. Uh, what were your thoughts on our interview with uh, Wayne Lackey? Wayne, always a fun dude to talk to. Um, I think talking about – so uh, I really liked his perspective of – we get in part of the conversation, get talking about whether like to just bounce. All right, his thought process, instead of like bouncing to a completely new area that maybe you have a little bit less – uh, history with but you're just gonna go listen for birds and go hunt something verse even if, if they're shut down and quiet where you're at sticking with it yeah or staying within that area like an area you know i thought was really interesting because i think we've been guilty of that i know a lot of people that probably listen to this podcast do that some too especially if you hunt publicly and it's you know if it's not working great on a piece of public you're on and you've got some history there but they're not talking they're not gobbling and you go bounce to another spot you know, other than hearing some birds, what get thinks what makes you think that you're going to be more successful on a, an area that you have a lot less, you know, yeah. uh, history with? Because one thing he brought up was like his scouting method, which is just based off like decades of experience, knowing all the different features and first off historically where turkeys like to be at different points of the season, but also what are some of those obstacles or train features or issues that could like cause a turkey to hang up. And knowing how to deal with that before you ever call back to a turkey if he's gobbling. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting, like really learning an, an, an area and kind of expanding out from there instead of like trying to learn four or five different pieces of public land and bouncing around from, you know, just find a couple or, you know, find one big area that you can really stick with and, you know, learn exactly what those turkeys do in those areas. Um, but I'll say this, some people aren't some people aren't necessarily gifted with that because maybe they live in a different state or they live in a different part of a state where there's a lot less turkeys and they're like, well, mm-hmm. you know, I can try to learn this area or I can try to go to an area that's a little bit further away that maybe has more birds and I can really try to figure that area out. I mean, I think that's something everybody's going to kind of deal with, but you know, um, it's just one of those things that I, I thought was a, a pretty wise tip, you know, not spread yourself out too thin and, and really trying to hone in on an area because at some point they should, you know, as long as you have time to hunt, you should be able to find that right day when they're, you know, gobbler's ready to die and you're able to, you know, capitalize on it. But I'll say this, it also makes me wonder, and I think you and me have been guilty of this in the past, um, especially when we were first starting to hunt public land, you know, working during the week or going to school during the week or whatever, and you only have like weekends to hunt, mm-hmm. you're very eager to like just run around and just, like, yeah, just do stuff. Well, you're trying, yeah. I feel like in that case, you're very, you put more stress on yourself, to, like, I've got to execute now, 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 because I only have one day to hunt for the next seven days. And then, you know, I've got to wait another six days or so before I can hunt again. Yep. And especially I, with turkeys, where you only get like, if, if you're in that situation, you get like six days to hunt turkeys. That's it. Yeah, well, especially like public this year, like on WMAs, you only get 30 days total, yeah, roughly the season. Maybe actually a little bit more than 30 days because there's more than 30 days in, in April. Um, but you know, get like 31, 32 days, whatever, 31 days to hunt on, on WMAs in Alabama where we used to be able to have 45 days. Yeah. 
So that makes it, you know, if you're a weekend warrior, man. That's tough. You're talking four, maybe five weekends that you really get a chance to hunt, yep. maybe. Um, and, you know, that makes it a lot more stressful. Um, so I don't know. But, yeah, that and then also um, him kind of talking about, like, the his perspective of, you know, calling to a turkey, but also, like, knowing when to, like, kind of shut up, kind of like what Lyle and Gary talked about, like, just throw the calls away yeah, and, like, let the bird, like, you know, really uh, seal the deal on his own, I, I thought it was really good as well. But, I mean, what was your kind of overall take from Wayne? Because, I mean, we've talked to Wayne a bunch, and mm-hmm. I mean, you've hunted with Wayne in the past. Yeah, I liked I liked what you were talking about, uh, not spreading yourself too thin, because that's for sure something that we've done in the mm-hmm. past a lot uh, with deer and turkey. And – uh, he's not the first person to tell me that. <laughs> I've had a lot of different guys tell me that. Be like, hey, you know, you probably do a lot better if you, uh, if you know, if you buckle down, buckle there. down. Because uh, like over the years, I think it was, it might have been Alan Summerford we were talking to, but like over the years, like killed some decent bucks. But I'm like looking to over these next couple of years, I'm looking to kill something like a lot bigger than what I have in the past, and. Uh, and that's that's usually the subject of the conversation with whoever I'm talking. It might be Alan, it might be Kevin Tullis, it might be Wes, it might be Michael Perry. They all kind of say the same thing when it comes to deer or turkey, like in yeah. Wayne's case. And and that is when you hop around that much, it's really hard to have success, mm-hmm. um, especially at l- like a higher level, whether it be killing a, a really big deer or getting your four birds that you're allowed in Alabama. Yeah, and uh, and. I think, I don't know, it's just a really good point. And I've, my perspective has changed on it in the last couple of years where now um, it's probably been pretty aggravating for like you and our friend group. But it's like a lot of times I'm trying to not take as many hunting trips unless it's an area that I'm wanting to actually build history with. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Because I still want to go places and like, because yeah, you might hear that and be like, oh, you know, like that means you like can't ever go hunt a different area. You can't ever travel. And it's like, no, I have a couple of different WMAs I want to be able to hunt. But if I'm going to go hunt it, now I'm um, being a little bit more reserved about where I go. Where a couple of years ago, I'd, it'd be like, you want to go to so-and-so WMA? I'm like, yeah. And yeah. we just go and we go. Four hours one direction, four hours another direction, yeah. seven hours over here, and two just, hours over there. It gets scum- Sometimes we kill something. Yeah. Sometimes, a lot of times we don't. Yeah. And uh, and now it's like, now I'm a lot more calculated, uh, and I'm like, okay, like, what's a place that I could see myself hunting for, like, five, six years, you know, and, like, really figuring out, um, and I, I'm doing the same thing with deer and turkey, so, like, one of the places that we hunted this January for deer, that's one of the reasons that I was interested in that place, because I'm like, I could see myself coming back here over and over again, like, the, the situation mm-hmm. just kind of seems right, and, and so that's why I wanted to go hunt that spot that place specifically. And I want to do the same thing with turkeys. And really you're kind of doing that with turkeys and, and where you killed your bird last year, cause you've been building a little bit of history with mm-hmm. that spot. And you're already talking about going back in there again this year, mm-hmm. uh, on opening week. So like, I feel like you're already kind of starting to do that, but we also yeah. have some history already in some other areas where maybe we don't know it like the back of our hand, but there is something to be said about getting that I, I call it like rolling the snowball downhill. Mm-hmm. You know, like you're you got the you got the ball rolling, and now you're learning more and more about that area. Yeah, I feel there's two specific areas I feel very confident in for this season. If the birds are, you know, the birds should be back in there. I mean, I went back in one spot, and they were there this fall. And the last three years, I've gone in there. They're there in the fall, in the spring. But um, in the other area, we've got I've got two years or maybe three years of history as well. And there's birds always in there, and it's just like. It, one of the areas sets up better than the other. One like one of the areas where I killed my first bird uh, on public last year, first one of the season, um, sets up really good to be able to, like, you know, kind of get in around some thick cover and get set up on some birds. The other one, it's tough. And there's a reason it's tough. There's, I mean, there's a reason why there's turkeys there because it's, it's hard to get in there and freaking kill one of them. Um, but they're there. And it's like, you know, you don't have to – run super far from the truck. I mean, you can if you want to, but it, it's like, it, it makes it very, very challenging. But one thing I, I realized, I was taking notes on this last year, is the patterns of where I was seeing at different points of the season scratching before scratching kind of stopped. Yeah. And now in both, well, in, in one of the areas there, I didn't kill him, but I got on some birds and I, I talked about this before. Past the freaking Galler, I think he was a freaking bearded hen before daylight, which I mean, I couldn't have shot him before. It was early as crap. But anyway, long story short, um, there were specific patterns of like 
those birds would like do like a big circle, like um, almost like scratching pattern. Like they'd go, they'd be on one, one section for like a day or two, mm-hmm. and then that scratching would dry up, yep. and you'd go to the like the back side, um, or like go a little bit further back in, and you find fresher scratching. It was like they were doing like a big circle. It seemed like they the same yeah. drove turkeys and hens and everything else, and it's like you know, kind of knowing what that pattern looked like, kind of figuring out like, hey, if I don't find sign here, like, you know, not super far from the truck, then they're probably back in this one spot. And I, I've got a couple of different ways to get back in there in order to try to get on those birds. Yep. Um, so, yeah, just compounding. I mean, I'm trying, so I'm, that's what I'm trying to do for turkey hunting this year is like what we typically do for deer is like compounding what we learned last year and not trying to start fresh again, but use what we learned last year to apply for this year when it comes to, you know, where the birds were at certain times, where were like their favorite roosting spots. Yeah. And also based off like remembering, you know, bird came off a roost last year. Where did it seem like the gobblers would go and start gobbling from? Yep. And the, the thought process is this year, you know, again, spot checking some of that, but I already know where they like to go Yep. to gobble from, like the little gobble zones and everything, start zones, uh, your, their legs, and it's beating them to that spot before they even get there in the mornings. Yes. And set up, do yeah. some soft calling. They're already used to hens coming in there and getting ready pre- and prepared to shoot those turkeys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm excited too hearing him talk about that because that's I feel like how the club is going to be for me this year. I was able to kill a bird out there last year. I scared a whole bunch of birds out there last mm-hmm. year, uh, just learning the property more. But since that happened, first of all, I got a whole turkey season where we just ran all over the place hunting turkeys out there. Uh, then this fall, I intentionally squirrel hunted several areas a couple times. And uh, part of it was me just wanting to squirrel hunt. Uh, Part of it was me scouting for deer, but also part of it was me kind of in the back of my mind, having turkeys in the back of my mind, uh, trying to figure out like, hey, what does this bowl look like? Um, There's actually some areas that I went and hunted through that I was turkey hunting around last year that I couldn't call a bird like across this thing. And I was like, why would he not come across that? And so I was able to go down in there and like look at it and and try to learn about that. The hills were like way steeper than I thought Mm -hmm. they were, but now I've I know that area where I killed my bird last year. I know that area very well now. I've walked it up and down several times uh, through deer hunting, turkey hunting, and squirrel hunting. So I'm excited about that. Uh, but then also kind of talking about going and getting the ball rolling downhill. Like you know, I've already gotten a couple invites to go different places, and I probably will go to like a couple other places this spring at some point. But my main objective is to first and foremost turkey hunt the club because I think that's where I'm going to kill turkeys. And then second of all, go turkey hunt places that I'm interested in deer hunting. Mm -hmm. And again, like, I'm just trying to create that snowball and roll it downhill this turkey season. So I've got one area in particular last year where uh, I think it's going to be good for deer hunting. I turkey hunted it last year and had a bird at like 60 yards gobbling right on top of me and I couldn't kill him. And, uh, And so I've got a little bit of turkey history with that place and I've got a little bit of deer history with it. And those two are going to kind of feed into each other because this is a place I can definitely see myself deer hunting over the next couple of years. So I'm going to go in there with that like mindset where this turkey season, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to turkey hunt, I'm going to have fun, but I'm going to be dropping pins for deer. Mm. And this deer season, I'm going to be in there deer hunting, having fun doing that, but I'm also going to be dropping pins for turkeys and just taking mental notes of like how the lay of the land is and whatnot. So Super excited about that. Yeah, because like, the, well, and kind of feed off that. That's how I found the one area where I killed uh, my public land bird last year in Alabama. I was deer hunting it, and in the fall, found a big, big group of um, long beards back there. Dropped a pin on it, went back and checked it, and they were there that spring and was able to kill one uh, the first time hunting it. And mm, cell camp check in. We got some long beards, boy. Let's go. Look at that. All right, cool. Okay, they are far. <laughs> they're so far yeah those would be some fun turkeys to hunt anyways i'm sorry yeah no but um anyway but just I, I found that area during deer season and just went back spot checked it and that's one thing i've kind of noticed is like in some of these areas i don't think i know every every probably state and region of states are a little bit different but i feel like as long as you don't have like massive flooding or anything that really like changes the landscape or i mean even like logging activity i don't think makes a huge difference unless it just completely wipes out a ton of the roost trees yeah but it's like the turkeys are going to be back in some of the general areas like if you find a big group of turkeys in the fall the hens are probably going to be somewhere in that same general area in the springtime if it has a decent amount of diversity yep um and anyways it worked out for me well last year and i'm excited to do it this year because again when we hunted a couple other pieces of public if i decide i want to bounce turkey hunt somewhere else 
got some pins dropped where I found turkeys during deer season in some other areas. So yep, we'll have to see. But um, I don't know. Those areas I'm kind of intimidated in turkey hunt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So might be uh, a little rough. Yeah. It, well, I mean, not not even rough. Just I don't. It's a lot of snakes. So mm. you know, just it just kind of. That's true. You know, I, it's kind of like when Gary was talking about, he said, man, you can't be a turkey hunter and be scared of snakes. I'm not scared of snakes, but I don't want to step on a big old timber rattlesnake. You're mindful. It's real. Mindful. You know, like paying attention. You know, c- copperheads, one th- I mean, don't want to step on any venomous snake. You got snake base, don't you? I know, but dude, a big timber rattlesnake, he might hit you at the thigh. I don't know. Well, if that happens, it's just your time, son. <laughs> God's calling you home. <laughs> Hey, it's like Benny said a couple of weeks ago. He's like, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Yeah. This is coming from the man Dude, who's been bit like three times I, by Cottonmouth, I, by the way. I know, but see. That, I don't think I said that on the podcast, but Benny has been yeah, bit several he's times. He's been bit many a time. But that's another reason where like, I hear guys like, oh, I'm going to crawl up and like get right over the ridge. Gobbler, you know, stopped at 60 yards over the ridge point. I can't, you know, I can't shoot him. But if I get up to that edge, I'll be able to shoot him. I don't. I wouldn't mind crawling. Okay. Get tagged right in the forehead. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, dude. I don't mind. I don't <laughs> mind the crawl. Like, I physically don't mind that. But it's like, just the um, like, you coming through some hardwoods and there's a timber rattlesnake and you don't see him and you know they don't like to rattle a whole bunch. Okay. No. But you crawl crawl right up and he's right next to your face when you're like not paying attention because you're trying to stay low and ease. Oh, dude. Oh my God. That that's Oof. that's a worst case scenario, son. Mm. Get tagged right on the cheek, dude. You know? Oh man. That would that, oh. would that would uh that would not be good. That sucker's got a head like your freaking kid is coming. <laughs> 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 That's oh. what it sounds like too when he it hits. It's probably like <laughs> oh god, oh my god. There is nothing worse. Have oh, you ever, you've heard people talk about it where they're like, when you get hit by a timber rattlesnake, it feels like someone like hitting you with a nine iron in the shin. Oh yeah, I mean, or, yeah. like they hit well, so hard. Dude, Anthony at the farm, dude. Like, there's some timber rattlesnakes down there. Like when we did a, that fire back in July, Prescott fire down there. No, uh, one of the guys helping us with the fire, he saw like a four foot timber rail snake, you know, coming out past the burn. And um anyway, but he was down there and found one when he was running the tractor in one of the food pots and he took a shovel out there. He was gonna kill the thing, but he was also just gonna, you know, see what happened. He put that shovel, I'm talking about like right in front of his face, and it was it was hit it was hissing and freaking rattling the whole nine yards. <gasps> and he stuck that shovel right next to it and it hit that shovel and it says ding. <laughs> I mean, dude, he's like, dude, that sucker had some had some oomph behind it, okay? Jeez. And uh, he's like, yeah, that 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 one's not with us anymore. But <laughs> he didn't make it. No, but uh, you know, it's I don't know, I don't know. That's that's the that, you know, cotton mouse are one like cotton mouse. You know, I, I don't they ain't gonna strike you very high. They can get you right around the ankle, little ankle biters and stuff. But a freaking timber rattlesnake, dude, that sucker can reach up, especially like a big one. Like we've gone some areas, and I found some big old timber rattlesnake sheds during deer season. Yep. Um, and just some real rocky areas, and I'm like, dude, uh, uh-uh. uh, mm. mm, 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 mm. you, you ain't catching me crawling through none of that crap. No, it ain't gonna happen. Be walking with that turkey. That, that turkey is gonna make it. I'll hunt them a different day. That's right. At that point. There you go. Like, you won. So, let's get over some Q&As. Let's hit some Q&As. Now that we freaked everybody out about snakes right before turkey season comes in. I mean, just get you some snake boots. Get you some good, comfortable snake boots. Just check the tree before you sit down in the the crook of the tree. And check around the tree, not just on the side you're sitting on. Always check around the back side of the tree, the whole nine yards. You feel something nudge you. He's like, hey, man, I'm kind of (laughs) cold. Dude, I've seen too. Mind many, if I snuggle up? I've seen too many reels, dude, of guys sitting and they're like, "What? What is?" That? And they're like they're filming and they're like, or they already see it and they film because it's like right next to them, a big old timber rattlesnake coming like slithering around the tree. Cool thing is they're pretty chilled out. Like, yeah. The, the only time I've ever had a timber rattlesnake rattle at me is when I've intentionally tried to hit it with something. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> other than that, they're like, "I'm just gonna sit here and mellow out." Like, it's not like an eastern dime, but eastern diamondback, bro. I, there was one dude who we interview. Uh, oh, um. We didn't interview the guy, but it's gonna guy we're gonna have on the Hunts Florida. Whole oh bunch. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he was talking about walking in, and ha- and he's like that. I think the, he said the rattle was broken on that on that uh, Eastern Diamondback. He was walking down a logging road uh, or like a, one of those buggy trails in Florida, and he just heard like a hiss, like but like no rattle. And he's like, what? And he he told us that when we were up there grabbing a beer. Yeah. And he looked down. And he's like a big old Eastern Diamondback laying right there, it's, you know. But he's like, you know, he didn't. His rattle was like broke off. Like he was moving his tail, but nothing was rattling. He didn't have a rattle on. So yeah, that's good. Mm. Nope. Mm. All right, let's hit some Q and A's. <laughs> well, let's get some snake Q and A's going. Yeah, let's get some snake Q and A's. Well, I want to hear your best snake story, guys. I got some good ones. We'll tell on another episode. All right. First up, we got Sebastian Lowen from South Carolina. He says. 
how would you begin to scout slash hunt a leeward ridge if you had never been there? You guys should plan a trip to South Carolina to see if you guys can get one down. By the way, this is a deer question. Uh, South Carolina is on the radar for uh, we got some projects coming up. We're we're in some talks trying to figure out how, what we would where we'd go what what we would do. Yep. But South Carolina is for sure in the mix. So so my thing is if you're gonna scout a Leeward Ridge, why that ridge versus any other ridge? Yeah, like you got to have something else other than just a ridge laying there. Like you got some timber cutting activities or some kind of habitat diversity. This is, I'm just gonna take the question answer. Um, it, right, you're probably about to say exactly what I was. Well, gonna it's say. Like, you have compounding features. Like you got to have something more than just a ridge there. Like maybe it's the only ridge, and like it's just like focal area where like it's the only high spot, and deer are probably gonna run it. But if there's multiple ridges, why would you pick one over the other? And to me, it's gotta be like you've got to have some kind of habitat diversity there, with some clear cuts, uh, hardwoods, pines, meat. If you're in South Carolina, probably got a lot of pines in that area. If I had to guess. Maybe some hardwoods as well. Um, you know, is there any big ditches that run up that leeward side of the ridge? Um, any secondary points coming off that leeward side that drops down? Explain leeward, by the way. Uh, downwind side, like yep. the back. So, like predominant wind. I'm just going to throw out. Say your predominant wind during deer season is the northwest wind. Okay, then it would be that southeastern side of the ridge or south side of the ridge, which is not always the case, by the way. Everyone talks like a northwest wind is your is like typically dominant. If we got a lot of cold weather, for yes. some people it is, but in a lot of parts of the southeast, it's really not. No, we have a lot of like east I'm, southeast is actually pretty prominent throughout the. But anyways, keep going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, east southeast, uh, especially a southeast wind could be very, very common during during season unless you have, like, a big cold front that's either sitting on top of you or a front pushing through. But typically, like, we've had Shane Park on the podcast, and he talked about this with his own uh, wind study and, and trail cam study. He's like, you don't have a whole bunch of northwest winds that are consistent for long periods of time. Yep. 100%. So, you know, a lot of your leeward sides would be, like, the north slope of a ridge system that's running east to west. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway – I just to me, just you gotta have compounding features. So you have something else more than just a ridge there that would draw me to it. But if you're gonna scout it, my thing is depending on how big the ridge is, because we've hunted areas where the ridge is six foot tall, and we've hunted in areas where the ridge might be a couple hundred feet tall. Mm -hmm. So it, it if it's a real small ridge, you really want to make sure you look at both sides because we ran into this in a hunt this past year, where I ran the low side of a ridge, you ran the low side of this little ridge. And n none of us ever went to the top. And this little ridge, like, you can almost see over the thing. The thing's, like, five, six foot tall. Oh, yeah. And and finally, me and Mike, I was like, dude, let's go up there and just mm. see what's on top oh, of this, this little ridge. Oh, that's a great ridge. point. And because we were walking down the edge of it on the lower side and didn't see anything. The second we got up on top, it was gigantic rubs everywhere and a cell camera of a listener to the podcast. Uh, <laughs> yep. You know who you are. And because uh, you got me on camera and you messaged me about it. But, like, we got up there, and it was all this big buck sign right on that little high spot. And it was the only little high spot in, like, that little area. Um, and the deer were just running it. But, you know, to me, to scout a ridge effectively, you need to run, like, the top edge of the ridge. You need to run, you know, my thing is, like, how far can I see? If I get on top of that ridge and I can see 100 yards down on each side, may or may not be a great place to scout, but just look at it. But then I like to try to go that my thought process is I want to go to the edge. Like once I run that part, I want to go further down to where I can't see and then run that section and see how further down I can look, especially if it's a big mm -hmm. ridge system. Uh, just so you can like visually look for, especially your rubs, uh, trails, uh, maybe be able to see some scrapes as well. Um, and, and so on. But what, what's your take on that? Pretty much exactly that. Just cause it's a leeward ridge doesn't really like, get my attention mm -hmm. at all um i would want to like you're talking about i'd want to look at the habitat on the brit like what are the things that get me there to begin with you yeah. know like is it it's the habitat the compounding terrain features that's what's going to make me interested at least in, our, in a ridge and again I, I think a lot of our past podcast guests too i think they would kind of fall into that category because of all the guys that we interview um it's not super common to have them talk about like intentionally go into a leeward ridge they might throw that in there as a detail like oh yeah this is leeward but uh but usually it, it doesn't have anything to do with that usually it's more to do with like the the habitat or the train except features. for one clifton denny yeah it, yeah not not all of them i mean we've we've done a lot of different people on the podcast over the years like and they're all different but just as a rule of thought like most of them don't ever mention I, that i don't have Wouldn't my phone say? but yeah you need to look at that clifton denny episode and mention that because i mean he talks a ton about you know, hunting leeward ridges uh, and having a lot of success on leeward ridges. Uh, also, he did a Patreon uh, Zoom meeting with us and, and talked even more details on that. 
Um, oh, you see, you're using the right feature. Look at you. Yeah. Search the name. Listen. Episode 418 is that Q&A that we did with him uh, from Patreon. 418, okay. 418. And then the other one is episode 300, Predicting Wind Currents and Buck Trails by Topo Map with Clifton Denny. That was a yeah, that was a great one. Yeah, because he likes to go and blind in some of those areas and has pretty good success even bow hunting some of those areas. So, yeah, Clifton Denny. Uh, by the way, we had somebody message us uh, at one point about uh, there must have been some miscommunication. I was talking about on Apple Podcasts, and you might be able to do it on Spotify, but I listen to Apple Podcasts. You can actually go and there's a search bar there where you can click on my libraries uh, and then hit the search bar at the top, and you can search a guest's name as long as you know how to spell it correctly, and it'll pull up any episodes that of the shows that you're subscribed to, it'll pull up any of those episodes that uh, he's, that person's been on. And I think that, that person, someone messaged us and was like, I guess they tried to do it with the, um, with the uh, episode number yep. and it didn't work. You can't do it with the episode number. You have to do it with their name. But yep. if, you, if you do it with their name, it'll pull up all the episodes. And that's how you can quickly find a lot of these guys instead of going, scrolling all the way down, you know, two, three years ago to look for a specific episode number. You search their name and it'll pop right up for yep, you. Definitely. All right. Next up. Uh, this is from Nathan Campbell in Alabama. He said, I've been hunting the blank national forest and I have been hearing dog drives all around. What would be the best tactic to use for the dog drive to use the dog drives to my advantage while hunting from a tree stand? This is a, this is a great question. Well, Um, we've got a guy. I'm going to, I'm going to say this right now. Yep. And you talked to him a little bit in the past. I talked to him in great detail while we were in Pheasant Fest about this. Here's a gentleman we're going to have on the podcast that, I mean, this dude specializes in killing big deer with a bow and gun in areas that are high, on public land that are highly pressured by dog hunters. And he has a, a method to the madness on what he does and kills some really big deer. Uh, he's actually in North Carolina. And uh, we're going to get him on probably later, later this summer, early fall, to talk a little bit about it. Because any of you guys that are hunting in areas with a lot of dog hunting pressure, I can't imagine what that would be like in, in a lot of detail. Um, and we've got buddies of ours that, you know, dog hunt or like, you know, do some of these dog hunts on different pieces of public land in Alabama. But it's one of those things that it could be super, super hard, when, especially if you're getting into it and you're used to hunting clubs and leases and places without dog hunting pressure. It, it's a huge hurdle you feel like you got to overcome. But this guy that we're going to have on Bride has got it down pat. Now, I picked his brain about it. But it's one of those things, especially like on a topic like this is, if you if you're constantly first off, I'll ask you this: Are you finding sign that you're excited about hunting? First off, mm-hmm. if you're finding stuff you're excited about hunting, great. If not, maybe bounce to a slightly different area. You know, whether it's more remote and it's one of those things that it's harder for guys to turn dogs loose, um, or getting a little bit further back because it seems like from the guys I've talked to that dog hunt, nobody if they cut the dogs loose at a certain spot on some public land. The, everybody seems to be set up on a logging road, a main road. Yeah. They're not walking in crazy, crazy far to try to go shoot a deer. Yeah. Um, but then they kind of use the deer to run them up over ridges and stuff. And use the to, dogs to run the deer. You said use the deer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> use the dogs to run the deer. Yeah, use the deer to run the deer. There you go. That'd be something. That'd be cool. <laughs> the Judas deer. <laughs> the Judas deer. <laughs> um, betrays all the other deer. Yeah, but anyway, it's it's just one of those things. I feel like that's when it gets back to like getting your remoter areas that even if they're c- cutting dogs loose, where can a deer like not get shot at? Like, Where is he going to get into? Where is some deer going to get into that keeps them? Even if a dog's running them, he might be running circles in an area that's a little bit harder to get into, more rugged, more steep. Um further back, whatever, and, and use it to your advantage. But also, the, I think in Alabama, don't they only have it's – it's a short window to dog hunt in public, right? Yeah, it's a pretty short window. I don't know exactly what it is, but um, it's it's pretty limited. And I think you're right, too. I don't think that uh, m- many guys are actually getting far into the woods when they're dog hunting. And I feel like this is a great, a great way to study up on your escape routes. Mm-hmm. I mean, because you, you could – the way that my mind immediately goes is you could take – uh, like Wes's method mm-hmm. of like wolf packing and kind of apply it to this, uh, where if you go look at, okay, where is the, what is, what is the like timber block they're going to be cutting loose the, the dogs into? Because they'll usually hunt the same areas, you know, over and over again, yeah. year to year. Or a lot of times too, you see all of them, you stop at the gas station, there's 35 guys there. I've, I've seen this, uh, you stop in and talk to them be like, Hey, where are y'all running today? And, uh, and just ask them. And uh, once you get a good idea of where they like to run, like what blocks they like to push, mm-hmm. then maybe you can look at that and say, okay, where's the cover in here that the deer are probably going to be holding on? Where are they probably going to go to? 
Um, and how can I set up, you know, to take advantage of that? Yeah. Um, or, or even set up, you know, on the back door somewhere where you're catching uh, like a buck slip out the back side. Mm -hmm. We've heard people talk about that in the past. Um, actually Benny would be a good one to talk to about that. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, that, that's where my mind immediately goes is escape routes, mm -hmm. like goes going and setting up on an escape route. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's an interesting, I'm excited to talk to that guy. That's going to be fun. Yeah, it'll be it'll be a good episode because I think we get enough messages about dog hunting and and how to get around that and still be successful in those areas. So uh, Brian will be a, a huge resource uh, for everybody when we get that episode out and get it recorded. Yep, cool. All right, this is from Colby Smith in Alabama. He said, "Hey guys, just pulled a cam that has been sitting since August, flipping through the pics and stumbled upon something quite interesting. On October thirteenth, I had a picture of a spike breeding a doe." This is Colbert County, where our rut is generally not wide open until January. What is y'all's take on this? Do you think she cycled early after the 2022-2023 season, even through summer until she was bred? Makes you wonder, do deer just have casual sex sometimes? <laughs> I'll email a pic to you guys, but this blew my mind, LOL. That's my take. <laughs> she got lazy, that little buck just harassed her. She's like, do your thing, but I'm not ready. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be looking at it like, oh, we got an early doe, hey. unless, unless, you got like a big flurry of bucks acting stupid on or, that camera. Or also, I, I, if it was a little spike on camera doing just like jump, because I mean they jump on each other. It doesn't mean yeah. they're actually breeding. They're just they'll jump on the back of each other too. Yeah. But if it was, it, I would take it differently if you had a big mature buck or like a mature buck doing that. Yeah. To me, that would be a little bit different than, you know, a one-year-old deer, you know, mm -hmm. spike going out trying to breed a doe. Yeah. You know, that's that's something. It's, I wouldn't take that into a lot of consideration. But if you did have, like you said, a flurry of buck activity, especially mature buck activity, and then you had, say, a more mature buck breed that doe, mm -hmm. I would take that with a, a lot more um, seriousness than a spike doing it. Yeah, personally. I agree. I definitely agree. Yeah, I've got a bunch of videos of spikes like mounting each other. Yeah, I mean... Of course, the jokes just write themselves there. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, boys being boys, let me tell you. <laughs> what kind of boys are you hanging out with? Oh, listen, dude. <laughs> you went to that all-boys school, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't much to do around there, folks. Oh, man. <laughs> anyways, anyways. Uh, yeah, no, I, I would be interested to see, like, if anything else happened. Because one thing, that last camera I pulled at the hunting club, um, when a doe would come, it was very obvious when a doe in the area was coming yeah. into heat there because you would get all kinds of deer on camera, mm -hmm. and they would just be acting stupid. I mean, especially the younger deer. They, they'd be running around, panting, and you'd get, like, a flurry of activity where for, like, 12 hours there was all kinds of deer just coming in and out of this area. Um so I'd be curious to know if, if that camera or any of your other ones had that kind of activity. If not, then it uh, probably wasn't anything. Like yeah. I don't think she would cycle through like that. That's pretty rare. Because uh, I think we talked to Mariah Boggess about that, and he was talking about the secondary rut and how we we tend to talk about the secondary rut like it's a, like it's a staple. It happens everywhere every year. He's like, it's actually a little bit more rare than you'd think because usually those does do get bred. Um, and so it's not like, you know, 50% of your does just didn't get bred, so they're mm -hmm. cycling back through. Um, but anyways, that's an interesting subject. Uh, all right, we got time for one last one, and we're going to do a turkey one. This is from Chris Goodwin here in Alabama. Chris, got to meet him at yep. the Weaver's Meetup. Great meeting you, dude. Um, what is the best way to identify a turkey strutting zone and where they usually... Uh, and are they usually close to the roost, or how does that work slash lay out? This will be our first season ever hunting turkeys. I usually see them when I'm deer hunting, just trying to make a better plan before I revisit those areas. Thanks, and great to see you all again at the Weaver's Big Buck Contest and Hunter's Meetup. Best of luck. Cool. Um, so I would say it doesn't necessarily have to be close to where they roost, and for me, the best way to identify is kind of like we talked about uh with um, Mike Pentecost a couple years ago where we just reposted that episode. The way that I like to do it is I like to go listen to where they kind of typically congregate and go to. And uh, well, if, you're, if you're here when gobble 8, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, yeah. he's probably in one of those strut zones, you know, one of those leks. 
Well, and, and especially if you hear that on multiple different days mm-hmm. where you're like, man, they're like, they always go to that field. They always go to that ridge point. Yeah. They always go to that cutover. Or like that, it's always. Or, or that holler, that for, that thermal hub they get down into for whatever reason. Yep. It's like there's different situations, but I think that's where you identify it more so than finding sign. Mm-hmm. It's like, where are you actually hearing birds consistently at least a couple different times uh, throughout maybe a week? where they're gobbling from a very specific spot or a couple of specific spots, drop it on X, pull up the map, try to figure out what could be there, especially in hill country. It's going to be some, typically it's going to be some kind of ridge point. Every now and then, like you had that situation last year, every now and then they'll be down the freaking bottom, yeah. you know, in between a couple of different drainages, thermal hub gobbling, just because they can, ca- it seems like they just can gobble out from there. And then plus, seems like it's going to be a little bit more open in that spot than maybe on one of the ridge points. Yep. But, you know, if the, if the timber's fairly open where they can see and not have a predator sneak up on them, you know, they're going to be up on some kind of ridge point gobbling. And, like, last year when I killed my own public, I had three gobblers. They were all roosted around this one big ridge point coming off a bigger ridge. And when I finally snuck in there like an hour and a half after they gobbled, or maybe almost two hours after they, they were gobbling on the roost because they didn't gobble on the ground, first calling sequence they came right back at one of the, they were down in one of the drainages next to me yep. and came right up to me within 10 minutes and they were just hanging out in that general spot so um yeah that, that's a big thing i think chris after you like hunt a few times this year you're gonna hear especially when they're gobbling you're gonna figure out pretty quickly what do they like to you know go towards plus you can find you know if you got a logging road going through a place we've seen this all the time you find tracks big gobbler tracks and strut marks yeah. with their wings yep. like going through an area that would be one of those spots, but it's also, it's kind of tough to figure out, you know, is that something they're using mid morning, early afternoon, late in the evening before going up to mm-hmm. roost? It's like, you can find that, but like, I've never had success and I don't know about you. I've never had success finding that and setting up in one of those areas and killing a gobbler right there. It's almost like finding the ones that are like where they're going to early in the morning and just, you know, if you can't kill them that morning, you beat them to that spot the next morning. You set up, do some soft calling, and potentially have them wor- work into you. Yeah, that is that is kind of tough because it's kind of like wh- how we talk about uh, a creek crossing for deer can be kind of deceptive where you go and it's just absolutely smashed, beat down with tracks, and you're like, oh, my gosh, they're destroying this. But in reality, it was three does that walked through there one time, and they just that's a lot of feet that they're leaving tracks with. It's kind of the same thing. Like if you go find like a logging pad or like a dusty road, a or, clear cut or a clear cut, like a fresh clear cut where there's like dirt, you'll go find where you'll go find like a bunch of gobbler tracks and those strut marks where he's dragging his wings on the ground. And they're pretty obvious when you see it. Uh, you'll know it when you see it. Uh, you'll go find that. And the, it'll be like insane. The amount of Turkey tracks when it, what that was, was one Turkey one time. Walked around in a circle, strutting there for like an hour. And so he just beat this area down. Now, when I start paying more attention to that, though, is if there's like a rain or if it's real windy and it kind of blows those tracks away, mm-hmm. and then you go back a couple of days later and it's like that again, That then I start paying more attention. I have had success in areas like that before. Um, but it's one of those things where, especially down in like southern hill country, they're, they got a lot of options, so they don't have to go to that one spot every single day. So don't just because you found a spot that they like to go to doesn't mean they're going to go to it once a day. Yeah, they might go to it once or twice a week. Mm-hmm. If you found a spot that they're coming to like three times a week, that's like a really good spot. Yeah, you know, it's, and it's the same thing with deer. Like if you found where a buck is coming through three times a week, that's like an unbelievable spot. Yeah, and also uh, I think one thing to consider as well is how high is it getting throughout the day. If you find where a a turkey strutting like say you just had a rain a couple days later it starts getting 80 85 degrees and you're finding where he's strutting in the wide open no shade around in an area mm-hmm. to me that's more than likely probably early morning or in that late afternoon when that sun's either kind of lo- not super high up and also you know uh same thing on the back end before it sets uh compared to like finding something like on a shaded road or something like that where they can get it out of shade because a turkey can overheat i've had pet turkeys growing up and those circles do not if it's hot they don't want to be anywhere in the exposed sun. They're going to be in the shade somewhere and, you know, kind of strutting, doing their own thing, but they're not going to be out in that wide open field. If it's 85, 90 degrees, they're not going to cook. I mean, yeah. they've got so much feathers and everything. Um, so, I mean, that's something else to kind of consider as well, you know, as it gets warmer and warmer, you know, where they may potentially be. But yeah, that's a really good If point. you want to learn more about turkeys, have some pet turkeys because they'll teach you a lot. Teach you, first off, a Jake how freaking much he wants to gobble and act like an idiot, and, uh, <laughs> and also how they react to temperature. So, yeah.
Anyway, cool. But yeah, other than that, appreciate everybody submitting uh, Q and A's. Again, you we didn't mention this earlier, but you can submit your Q and A's. There's a link down in the show notes below. Go down there. You can submit your Q and A's. Again, if you got some turkey questions you want to get answered uh, this spring, feel free to get those submitted down below. Uh, again, appreciate y'all watching the podcast on YouTube. Appreciate y'all listening to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever else you're listening from. Uh, appreciate everybody again purchasing some of the hats from us. So, other than that. Best luck to you guys. If you're in Mississippi, if you're in Florida, good luck to you. I know season's underway for you guys. Alabama boys, uh, you know, we just only have a, you know, if you're hunting private land, you only have a few days left by the time this episode comes out before season's open on private. Uh, so best luck to y'all this season. Love to get some listener success stories. If y'all go out and implement something that you heard on the podcast, uh, turkey hunting-wise, submit your uh, listener success story. Again, there's a listen, There's a link down in the show notes below on the podcast and on YouTube where you can actually submit your listener success story where you went out, implemented something you've heard on the podcast, maybe something, again, specifically for turkeys, and uh, went out there and had success implementing it. So, again, appreciate y'all watching, appreciate y'all listening, and we'll catch y'all back in the next episode from the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. And remember, guys, y'all stay Southern.